Where Mark? Yeah, good yourself. Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Yeah, how are you, Mark? You doing okay? Yeah, okay, mate. Howdy folks, I hope you're well. Welcome to the show. It, uh, it's going to be a good one today. And it's going to be a good one for a, uh, a good reason. And we've got Ian Evans on, the CEO of the RPRA. We're on to talk about everything to do with the RPRA, some of his opinions on the future of the sport. And, uh, and a whole lot more ultimately. It, just let me know that you can hear me all right and everybody can hear across all of the different channels that we've got. I'm uh, checking my end. I can, I can hear myself. If you've got questions for Ian, if you've got questions, good, bad or indifferent, we will, uh, we will deal with them all as long as they're respectful. Um, then let us know. Fire them in, and uh, we will just fire them into the comments, and then you can. Um, we will. We will. I will ask Ian all questions um, that come in. Again, as long as they're respectful, they can be positive. They can be challenging. Uh, any of that good stuff please remember to share it we've got uh 78 people watching at the moment across all the network so uh share it if you think somebody may be interested and again um don't share it too many times within the same groups they don't like it but again if you know any groups that you think might be interested um please share it and uh, yeah let's we'll we'll get on it promises to be a good one yes Let's have a quick look through before we get Ian on. Um, I'll go through any specific questions. Um, evening to everybody that said evening. I'm not going to name check you today because we'll just crack on. Uh, Tom Power says he can hear and see empty shelves. You can. Progress. That's called progress. Empty shelves is called progress. Uh, no sofa behind me. That's called progress because that ultimately means all being well. We're actually moving on Saturday. But anyway, we will see. Right. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, I'm genuinely excited and feel feel privileged, really, to get Ian on. In that, um, you know, I've got a lot of time for, for what he's been doing for the last three years or so. So let's see what he's got to say. So I will uh, bring Ian in now. And uh, we will say hello. How are you? Hey, Mark. How's it going? I'm all right, thank you. I'm all right. Um, so I'm just going to set you up, and so everybody can see you. That's it. We're all good. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, we've got a lot of people on already. We've got questions coming in um, already as well. But what we'll do is we will start talking. And um, yeah. and then we'll we'll deal with some questions. So just because I haven't asked you questions doesn't mean I will uh, I won't. But we've got questions I can see coming in already. But we'll uh, we'll start off and then we'll come back to that que those questions um, as they come in. We've got a lot of people joining as well. So if you're only just joining us, I can see we've uh, we're just about to hit 100 people watching. So that's uh, great. So thank you for everybody that shared. And everybody that's coming in. So, um, the first thing is, thank you for coming on. We've been talking all the time we've known each other. We've been talking about you coming on for a while. And obviously, um, now it's happened. So, 
I'm really happy about that. And thank you for coming on because it, uh, it, it, I think it's good for, for, for all of us. It's good for RPI TV that you come on and, and hopefully it will help uh, a lot of people understand about you and what you're trying to do and what needs to be happening. The first thing that I'd like you to do is just for anybody that doesn't know you very well, I would imagine most people know of you, but for those that you don't know you very well, uh, just talk a little bit about your background because I know for a fact that you're not a CEO of the RPRA that's not really a pigeon man. You've been a pigeon man for a long time. So perhaps just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, Mark, um, good evening and hello everyone who's uh, tuned in and thanks for doing so. Um, yeah, I've been around pigeons all my life, basically. My father raised pigeons, both my grandfathers, um, my two uncles raised pigeons and two of my cousins raised pigeons. I started actually racing in my own right when I was nine years of age after dad had shown me the ropes for a couple of years. Um, so that's now 35 years, 35 years ago, which, which has flown, to be honest with you. I still, t I still remember taking part in my in my first race, um, and yeah, always always enjoyed the pigeon racing game. Um, always been a keen club member, and for the last ten years or so, I've been uh, the local club secretary as well. I've got a picture actually that I pulled from the Homing World uh, about you. It's is on the screen now about your uh, first attempt at success. It was in the October 11th, I believe, last year's at Home in World. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that, that was worth a read. If anybody wants to go and read more about you, it was in October 11th last year. So you've been around pigeons all your life, which is an important thing when you're the CEO of a pigeon organization. And that's not always been the case in the past. And I think that's important for people to, to realize, you know, there's a reason you took this job um, and it wasn't necessarily for uh, what perhaps some people would think. You genuinely wanted to um, try and make a difference and, and, and bring some changes through as to what you see, which we'll talk about later on, about how you see things need to change. Um Right, so let's let's get on with our. Uh, got loads of questions coming in, loads of observations and questions coming in, but let's um, let's start off about. I've made some notes, um, so we'll just go through them, and then anything else you want to, you know, talk about, we can, and then we'll come to some questions. We'll probably do two question sessions, if that's all right. Uh, we'll we'll go in about uh, halfway, and then we'll go in about three quarters way with questions. And see how it all goes. So, the first thing to talk about is the rule one three nine, one member, one vote. So, yeah, talk to us about that and what your thoughts are, and then and everything, and the background to it as well. Yeah, that, yeah, I think it's very important, Mark. Actually, rule one three nine, and um, when when I was interviewed for the job of uh, general manager, as it was then at the RPRA. I was actually quite critical of the RPRA because I feel that the RPRA doesn't really reflect the majority view of its members in terms of its of in terms of what they want. Um, and when I took a post, one of the things that um, came about at the same time was the whole report. There was a lot of recommendations in the whole report in terms of how the association should change and develop. Most of it. I totally agreed with and to be honest with you most of it i'd experienced in my previous previous job and could see how the recommendations would move the sport forward and, and move the rpra forward um i think the one member one vote thing where the motivations for that come is uh about 18 months or so ago um i did a members consultation exercise we had 1100 responses to that process which doesn't sound like a great deal given that there was at the time 21,000 members in the rpra but in any, in any case, when you compare that to what percentage is engaged in the regional structure, I thought it was quite a good response. And what was alarming from my point of view was that the outcome of that consultation exercise showed that the membership really wanted to engage. And they, for example, the one member, one vote was posed as a question and 85% came back in favor of that. 
And when you compare that, contrast that to the actual feeling that comes back from the re regions, it actually flips it on his head 85% of the game. And you see that right, right the way throughout the sport. So from my point of view, I think move into a one member, one vote basis, rather than this kind of delegates process where the club has sent a delegate to the region, and obviously the regions select their delegates, which become the councillors on the RPRA um, council. I think when it comes to actually voting change and voting rules of the RPRA, I, I, I'm a firm believer that it should be done on a one member, one vote basis. And I, and I truly believe that if we get that, we will see an association that is more representative of membership. Because the reality of it is at the moment that, you know, the idea is that the RPRA, in theory, is ran, it's its members, it's ran by its members. That's the theory. Now, when we previously spoke, you said that the RPRA was formed in 1896. And ultimately, when it was formed, that way of doing things was very relevant and the best way of doing things. But my personal opinion, so my personal opinion is that, that it, it isn't. It's such a cumbersome way of doing it. Um, and it's... And it's interesting, I know from previous conversations we've had, like 85% of people would, in, when polled, would have voted for the Hall report suggestions and implementation to go through, when in reality it was defeated by 85%. So it's a complete flip. Now, why is that? The rhetorical question. It's probably because it is so difficult for people to, you've got to go to your club, discuss the rules that are going through. A club has got to send a representative. Correct me if I'm wrong on any step of the way. A club's got to send a representative. The club's then, that representative has got to go to the region and then yeah. it goes to council. If it yeah. goes through those processes, those each step. Yeah, but, yeah. We, have, we basically have a bottom-up approach. So, in, in theory, the, the, the men make the rules and, and decisions. Um, but a lengthy process, which, which as you mentioned in 1896 and even 40, 50 years ago, that was probably the most efficient and best way of doing it. But times have changed and with technology, it's quite easy to engage with members on an individual basis. Um, but you're right. The, the, I think the problem with the regional structure, and this is not to take away any, any, anything from anybody who's involved in the regional structure. They give up their time be a charge and put in the hard work and turn up at the meetings and, and do what they think is best. You know, I've got, I haven't got a problem with that, but the problem is that a very tiny, well, a tiny percentage actually engage in our regional structure, which is why we're getting the difference of opinions you see when compared to the consultation exercise. Um, and what and something think that is, do you think that's a practicality issue? Do you think it's an issue of, you know, you've actually got to go take, even if you could say it's a, a minimum an afternoon or a morning or whatever, you've got to go and take that out. M many times these regional meetings at the weekends. Um, is it anything more than just the practicalities of it? Or, you know, I mean, out of all the clubs in, in the RPRA, the percentage of clubs that actually send delegates to these meetings isn't that much, is it, in percentage terms? No, it's, it's tiny. Well, I wouldn't like to say, I mean, each, each region differs, but you're looking at a tiny percentage. Again, if you come back to the consultation exercise, there was roughly, what, well, 5% engaged? I, I would hazard a guess that probably through the regional structure, in reality, it's probably about 2%. But bearing in mind that consultation exercise was just a list of questions. There was no real vote. Uh, you know, if if it was a real vote on one member, one basis, you're probably looking, I, I would estimate you get at least 10% engaged, which doesn't sound a lot, but you're always going to get a tiny percentage engaged because most pigeon fanciers don't really care about what's happening in the RPRA. They just want to race their pigeons. And, and I get that, and that's fine. We just need to find more ways of engaging more people. So we got an organization, an association, which is more representative of, of their members. Now, wh why there is that big difference, I think, you know, to ask somebody to travel 70 mile round trip to attend a meeting is probably not acceptable to my mind. And 
you know, if I had to make a choice to travel 70 mile round trip to attend the meet, then I'd probably think twice to say the least. Um, and I suppose a lot of people just get fed up in the process. You know, having to, having to have a meeting in the club, discuss it all, then go to the region and discuss it all, and then that elevates the council. Why not just have a one member, one vote where people can think it through themselves, rationalise it, and vote online or on a paper based voting system and send it in? What do you think the opposition re- realistically would be to one member, one vote? Because to me, it it seems the right way, the the, the logical way, and, and arguably the democratic way of doing it. Because, you know, let's call it as it is. At this moment in time, the existing governing structure and, and the members up structure, we can, I mean, the one member, one vote promotes members up. It's, we're not taking away from that. We're just trying to streamline how it works. That's what you're talking about. But why do you think there would be an opposition to it? That's a really difficult question to ask, answer, Mark. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a question I've asked myself on numerous occasions, you know. Um, why would there be opposition to it? I don't know. I, I mean, I could probably hazard a guess, but to be honest with you, I'm a bit concerned about putting those guesses out there because they... They may not be accurate, and I don't want to call into question anybody's motivation behind anything. I just think that, you know, we, we need to recognise, and I keep coming back to it, we need to recognise that we have a tiny percentage engaged in the in the process, and we need to look at ways of increasing that uh, engagement numbers, really. Um, to, 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 you know, if, if we can get a one-member, one-vote through, I'm sure we will see a lot of things change in terms of rules and the governance structure of the RPRA to, to perhaps move it where it needs to be, including some of the recommendations in the old report. Yeah. Well, so the reality of it is that there's the rule 139 is going through. Now, we've got something else to talk about with, in regards to specific rules. Um, but what I want to do on the show tonight is, is use the show to implore people to get involved. Uh, which we'll come back to in a little in a, in a little while. There's another proposition coming in uh, that, that that's trying to come in about the, there's a new club proposition. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Again, since since I've been in the role um, for the past well over three years now, um, on numerous it's hardly a week goes by where I don't get a phone call from somebody who was perhaps trying to join a club, is not a member of an RPRA club, he's trying to just join his club to raise pigeons, and for whatever reason, he can't. It may be he falls in a dead zone, so he's not in any um, club's radius, which in itself is a difficult one to get over. Or it may be for other ungenuine reasons that perhaps they won't accept. And sometimes it's down to the fact that the person is a successful fancier and people don't want them in the club, they don't want the competition. That's not always the case. Sometimes there obviously are genuine reasons in behind those decisions but I think at the moment we have I think it's rule it's rule 159 where you know obviously you apply to join a club and it's a majority vote for the members to accept you or not which which again I accept having been involved in pigeon racing 35 years that's the right way to do it it should be done on a majority vote but we are seeing more and more instances where people are being if you want excluded from taking part in the sport they love so there's a proposition there to try and help genuine pigeon fanciers um, get into clubs. So whereas at the moment they don't have to give a reason if you refuse membership, what we're saying is that with the proposition that perhaps, well, clubs should give a reason why the membership's been refused. And if that, if that uh, decision is considered a genuine reason, then obviously it's up to the person themselves to decide whether they they appeal it at the moment. There's no appeal process if you remember the club, nothing at all. It's that's the decision, and you just get on with it and accept it. So, what the proposition is trying to do is put in a place where the applicant will be given an opportunity to um, appeal to its region, and its region will then determine whether the reason given is a genuine reason. And, and those could be with the with the um, with the proposed rule change. We put together a, a bit of an appendix which lists. It's not an exhaustive list. It can be added to. Um, you know, so if somebody's a defaulter, for example, um, if they're already a member of another RPRA club, um, then obviously there'd be genuine reasons to refuse membership. But what we can't do as an association, as a sport, is have 
hundreds of people out there who can't place pigeons simply because they can't get into a club. I think that has to change. And, and through that consultation exercise, I made a few notes earlier, when we put that consultation exercise, I was quite surprised, actually, because I asked the question, should clubs be able to refuse membership? Just a straightforward question, no caveats like I've just described over genuine or non-genuine reasons. And 60% came back and said that they shouldn't be able to refuse membership. Now, given my own, exp my own experience of pigeon fans, says I don't think it should be a simple case to say you can't refuse them. We, we, need, to get, we need to safeguard clubs against um, some people who would be detrimental to the club. Um, without going into detail, and, and the proposition has tried to account for all those scenarios. Um, uh, it's not, perfect. but it dep depends what the members define as as detrimental. Because I know what you yeah. meant, but yeah, if a club classes a new flyer coming into the club as detrimental, because said new flyer yeah. is going to beat them every single week, week in, week out. That should not be allowed to yeah. be viewed as detrimental. There's an inherent... Well, shall, shall, I, shall I read it? Yeah. Read, yeah. yeah. Shall, shall, I, shall, I, shall I read it out? It, it, basically, the company appendix to the rule says, the following reasons should not be considered justifiable. Any reason linked to the member's ability to race pigeons successfully or otherwise. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite simple, isn't it? It's, it is. It's not about um, doing away with competition. Your ability to race pigeons successfully or otherwise you might not be the best fancy in the world and people might not want you in the club, but that shouldn't be a reason to refuse your membership. You know, we should, we should, be, we should be encouraging competition, shouldn't we? That's the only way to get Don't better. Get it, the mentality of it. It's, it's like... It's like... An athletics club saying, no, I don't want that runner joining our club because he or she's going to beat me. Well, up you yeah. game. You know, I just, I don't, I just don't get, I just don't get it. Um, to me, if I was in a club and somebody kept beating me, I would find every single which way to try and compete with them and one day beat them. Uh, and yeah, it, it, helps, it helps you improve. I mean, I, I quote my father from some years ago. He, he, at the time in the club, he was secretary and we had a partnership with perhaps the best pigeon fanciers ever in Wales, a partnership by the name of uh, Liam Cooper. And um, they were fantastic races, unbelievable. But what, what happened was everybody in the club upped their game. They went and got better pigeons. They improved the way they raced their pigeons. And, and, and as a result, they all became far more successful in national racing as well because they knew they had to up the game to beat Lee and Cooper. And that's exactly what happened. They dragged, they dragged up that competition and, and everybody's ability to race pigeons. Mm. I mean, to me, I think personally, and again, it's only a personal opinion, I know it's not something that can be done, but I, I think all clubs should have a, a set radius. So, the, the, you know, the, the radius is, can't be changed and moved to, to, to prevent people from joining for the wrong reasons. So this, this rule is going forward, and, 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 and it is ridiculous the amount of people I hear of that can't join clubs. Um, whether they be new people or, or, or established flyers. And, and, it, and again, it's something that inherently needs to change. So let's hope the rule goes through. But again, that's another rule that people need to get out and vote on, you know? Mm -hmm. So the, the, there are yeah. two main things that you have, have helped try and get in for the AGM at the end of the month. Uh, yeah. The one member, one vote, which to me, again, I don't see any reason why people wouldn't want that. Um, it's like for me at the moment, I'm not a member of a club. I'm not going to be a member of a club. And so in theory, I have no voice, although I'm a member of the RPRA. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's countless people like yourself out there, and that should never be. You, you're a member. You should have a say in how the, how the association is governed and how the sport develops. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want it to be specifically to me, but if, if you remember the RPR and you're not a member of a club, you don't really have a great deal of input. And it's perhaps some people uh, like myself and others that should be able to have that input because they're not perhaps stuck in the, um, the local club scene, you know? We need outside thinkers into this whole thing. It's like the whole report. 
the whole report was a a quite a radical report really and, and i know you agreed with a lot you didn't agree with some of it and that was being introduced i think when you joined but for, yeah, the, whole, yeah. for the whole report to be uh, rejected again i just don't get it it's not like they had to accept everything it said but it was just rejected wasn't it yeah yeah it, it was mark but i think what, what we need to what we need to say here is that ultimately it was it was rejected by the members um, and I know that sounds harsh, and a lot of people are going to probably take a little bit of offence to that statement. But the fact is, it's correct because when I when I took the role, when I was interviewed for the role, um, I knew the whole report was being undertaken. It wasn't finalised at the time, but I was lucky enough to know the kind of things that perhaps come in through the whole report, and and that that well that helped me make a decision in terms of leaving quite a good job um, to join the RPRA because I thought, well, yeah, things. Things are going to change, and I, and I want to be part of that. Um, but again, coming back to it, I, I spent, I think it was a week, um, write the, rewriting the rule book, which is which is a task in itself, if, you, if you've ever looked at the RPRA rule book, uh, to implement those suggested changes um, contained within the oral report. Um, the, the, the then president and vice presidents came to the Reddings uh, and helped with that process. Um, and that was obviously distributed to the regions. It was published in the British Roman world, etc. What propositions were for the age? And in theory, again, that goes out to the membership to vote through the regional structure, which we've obviously discussed in, the, in a lot of detail, the, the merits and the, the pitfalls associated with that. But ultimately, it came back and it was the membership who resoundedly voted down all the propositions apart from the ones concentrated on the change of my job title which in essence means nothing wow so what so part of the reason for coming on obviously is to try and encourage people just to engage in that regional structure even if it's just for uh this one agm to try and change the change the existing rules to enable them to have a more of a say in the future through the one member one vote i mean that that's why you wanted to come on you wanted to put the case that people should engage for the purposes of what we've just been talking about for the last 20 minutes or so. If if people watching this yeah. want to see a one member, one vote and to see some new club proposition changes be accepted, those people need to get out and engage with their clubs and their regions. It's as simple as that. Without that, this is not going to change. And I know from speaking yeah. to you before, and you've said it to, now, you feel that the one member one vote proposal in particular is instrumental to any worthy change that's going to happen in this sport yeah i think it'll be the catalyst to change that i think um I was looking for the catalyst yeah I, I i think it will be the catalyst to change the way the association is governed in the future i mean again what i'd like to see and I know there's been a small bit of opposition to this, but what I see, which was a, which was one of the prominent recommendations in the whole report, would be to move away from a, a council kind of process to an executive committee of, say, five or six people um, who were empowered to actually run the sport, to make decisions when the decisions need to be made, to take opportunities when they arise and react to threats when they arise, which is a lot of threats out there to pigeon racing at the moment. And this kind of process where everything has to go back to the members and then be fed back up, slow, cumbersome, and it doesn't allow you to be, um, well, to be run as efficiently as possible. Well, it's not, it's not lean in any way. The process is not a lean machine in any way. It's actually like a massive corporations machine, which the RPRA is not. And like you said, strengths, opportunities weaknesses and threats cannot be addressed as it currently is. It just can't happen because it's such a long drawn out process. The fact that the the, 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 the council meets, is it twice a year? Twice a year. And, and, and again, you know, I want to put this out there. This isn't a criticism of the council as, as individuals because I sincerely mean this. I've, I've got to know a lot of them over the last few years and 95% of them are there for the right reasons and want to see progress. It's the kind of process that's, process that's holding it all back. Um, some might argue that they are part of the problem. I, I, I don't quite see it at that, as that. I think people just need to get out there and register the vote their votes in the current governance structure, however cumbersome that might be, 
in order to facilitate that change in the future. Because to do it now, it, it, it can't happen unless you engage in this long process to to make it happen. And again, like you said, and I'll reiterate, this is not against any one individual or anything, but I will say that twenty two people representing a council cannot be an efficient way, especially when they only meet twice a year. It, it's just it's it, it cannot facilitate change and it can't facilitate change as quickly as the sport needs i mean there's at the moment there's 22 people on that council like you said it needs to be five or six as a as a director board structure type thing and it needs to be a whole yeah. streamlined process um it just has to be yeah yeah and, and more more importantly mark you know as in addition to the executive committee, the executive committee need to be empowered through rule change to be able to make decisions on behalf of the half of the membership. But last thing, I mean, some people I've, I've seen some people write that I should be able to make all the decisions. Well, I don't agree with that. It, it, this shouldn't be a dictatorship. I, I don't know all the answers to everything. Um, well, you wouldn't want that responsibility either. And, and... <laughs> <laughs> I don't, think, I don't think an employee is the right person to make all the decisions because if they are making decisions for the wrong reasons, there's it's a bit more difficult to get rid of an employee than it is an elected representative on the, on the executive board. So the way I see it, obviously, I should be involved in that governance structure to, 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 a, to a large degree, but accountable to this executive committee who are put there by the membership. Hmm. You, you need to be able to make some... Uh, nominal, let's call them decisions on a daily, weekly basis and anything major needs to go to the board and that board needs to sit once a month and it needs to be five or six people. Just just getting 22 people together uh, once a month, you know, even mm-hmm. if it was remotely is a pain. You know, there's no reason why it has to be a physical meeting. Like when we talk about technology and we talk about the one member, one vote, yes, there are members that don't have internet access. Fine. Uh, that can be a postal-based thing or a, a, some form of, of postal or physical thing. A large percentage of people do have access to the internet. It could be a simple vote, log in, vote. Uh, yeah. And, you know, to me, and I know I sit in front of a computer all day, but to me, to be able to log on somewhere and make a vote on specific things, I can't think of anything better. Some people that are not on the internet, okay, Here's the form, you know, you can request to have postal entries sent to you just like you would with a polling card. To me, that makes sense. But from my understanding of it, this one member, one vote is a big part of moving anything else like we've just been talking about forward. Streamline process. And and look, the numbers speak for themselves. You know, I let let me I'm going to bring up a poll that I did. I did a poll. And I hope people can see it. Um, The poll was, should the way the RPRA is currently run change? At the moment, it's run from a bottom-up structure, et cetera, et cetera. I, I asked that question. Most people have seen it. And the results of the poll, it was the biggest poll I've ever had people voting on. 350 votes were were placed. So it was essentially saying, is change needed of how things are run? And it was an overwhelming 91% yes, change is needed. And 350 people voted on that one week poll. So a quarter of people voted on that poll that voted on on what you were talking about earlier, 1,200, 1,300 people. That was just on Facebook. Um, Yeah. So, according to that, 91% of people think change is needed. So, once again, without wishing to repeat ourselves, to make that change happen, people have got to get involved and, and push this change through. And it's as simple as that. If you're a member it really is of the yeah. go to regional meetings, it needs to for the purposes of this. Now, we'll talk about some more other stuff in a minute, but 
I wanted to highlight, I asked you for this specifically, um, the date, because this, this is the interesting, you know, this, this is the relevant thing. These are the RPRA regional meeting dates, everybody. All right? The Irish were last weekend. Northeast is on the 20th. Northwest is on the 20th. Cumbria is on the 15th. This is all of February. Devon and Cornwall on the 11th. Wales was last weekend. Western region, 22nd. Southwest on the 8th. East Midlands was last weekend. West Midlands was last weekend. London last weekend. Southern is the 8th, not too far away. And Derbyshire and North Yorkshire is the 22nd. So if, if you've got dates that are still there, I didn't realise East Midlands was last weekend. That would have been interesting, although I couldn't have had any part of it. I would have liked to have gone and seen how it worked. They're the dates, right? And I will put this up after this so people can see it. Um, and you, if you're in one of them regions that hasn't already had its regional meeting, you need to make sure that your club goes to those regional meetings and backs this one member, one vote, and backs the new club proposition. It's as simple as that. Without dictating what people should do, I don't see personally now any reason why people wouldn't want this to happen. Why would you not want one member, one vote? And why would you not want clubs to allow people in without a very good reason. So that's that part of, of, of it over. We'll move on to other areas. Again, still talking about very relevant things, but let's go through a bunch of comments and uh, observations and questions and what have you. Uh, this is in no particular order, folks, because I've got loads of streams going on. So I've got different people asking on different streams. Uh, Jason Smith says, why do people keep saying the sport is on its knees when there's no sign of it stopping? Some people seem to make more of it, to be making more of it. Um, I'll kick off that and then Ian can take give his take on it. Jason, the numbers don't lie. Back in the late eighties, membership was sixty something thousand. Now I think it's twenty one thousand. Ian, yeah, just over twenty thousand now. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I, I I think that answers it all. Um. Russell Bradford says, supposing the council vote not to endorse the RPRA's insurance package. Will that jeopardise the insurance package going forward beyond the March 1st, 2020 renewal date? There's a simple answer to that, yes. I, I'm, but by the way, I, I, I rather wouldn't use the word if council vote against it, if the membership vote against it. Because if the membership go to the regional meetings and vote for it or against whatever, they, if they think it's a good or wrong idea, that's the way the council, your regional representative of council has to vote. So they, you, you are, you are council regional representative, has to vote the way he's mandated, or she's mandated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Andy Pereira says, "Why is it so expensive to transfer non-UK rings?" Well, that's a, that's a very good question. It's an historic thing, to be honest with you. I don't want to really pass the back to you, but um, that that kind of fee has been in place. I, I, I wouldn't like to guess how long, really. But again, if you, if you want to change that kind of thing, then you need to engage in the process and get it changed. Yeah. Uh, and, and outside looking in, not really know what I'm talking about. Obviously, the RPRA has a GB database, which is built around GB. And I would imagine there is an associated extra workload with registering. I'm not saying it would represent a x 100 percent increase in cost or what have you but there would be a, i would imagine from technically workload point of view there would be a, an extra workload in in doing non such uh, gb rings um okay next thing is um baz nickel says 
Can we revisit this? This is a long one, so get ready here. Nigel yeah. Baycock cannot get into a federation where he lives. I think everyone in Pigeons knows Nigel. Why can't the association intervene on behalf of this fancier? His home is rural and there are no and there is no one for several miles, and yet the local Fed boundaries skirt around his property in order to keep him out. Before anyone talks about debtors, he should buy and he could buy and sell the lot of us. That's exactly what Baz has said. Yeah, I mean, it, it's again, it, this is just one example of hundreds of people out there in our situation. And, you know, when people say, why don't the association step in without harping on, the rules are made by the members, this bottom up approach. So if we had an executive committee who was empowered to make decisions, then perhaps I could understand the statement, why doesn't the association step in? But the fact is, the association, i.e., the council, can't change those rules. It's the members that have to change those rules. Mm. And this is this vote the, in a particular situation like that. And I know, and I know the situation uh, about Nigel. I think a lot of people would want to see a decision being made where somebody can intervene at RPRA level without it having to go to the members, and without. At risk sounding repetitive to to make that change look it, it it's all it's like a big bang theory right we need another big bang within the rprsa we as a sport this big bang needs to happen and this complete shift and change needs to happen and you're of the opinion one member one vote can be the catalyst to that happening then other things can start happening like if you've got a particular situation like him where he can't get into a fed it should be that the RPRA can intervene at board level and help. But at the moment, yeah. it comes it, down it, to my, the members. And how many members, when it comes... The reality is a lot of members don't particularly care. I'm saying this, not you. Are quite lazy in some ways. And, and for, I understand the travelling to meetings, and I'm not saying that. I'm just saying a lot of, a lot of members, in my humble opinion, are insular. If it doesn't affect them, they're not interested. But that's not fair because one day it could be affecting you and then you've got hundreds of people around you not caring whatever's happened to you. And in that particular case, again, from a structure and governance point of view, the RPRA should be able to go in and assist with that situation. But it can't yeah. because it's a members up structure. And, and, and for, it to become, for it to still be a members up structure, but with the power to be able to intervene at board level, this rule 139 needs to get through. Yeah. Mark, can, can, I, can I bring it back? There's a second part of that change in the Rule 159 over membership. Um, I, I give this some thought because there are people out there that fall in these dead zones I mentioned at the start of the interview. And um, so there's a, there's a new Rule 15C proposed. Um, any member of the RPRA who is not within the boundary of a club shall be granted upon written application to the Federation Secretary individual membership of his or her nearest federation. And then it, it goes through the kind of you know, the, the ability to refuse membership for justifiable reasons, the same it does for a club. So what we are saying there is, if somebody does fall in one of these dead zones, like, like Nigel Laycock, then he should be entitled to race pigeons in his nearest federation as an individual member rather than a member of a club. And he should be able to mark his pigeons at his nearest club as a member of that federation. Yeah, I agree. Um... <sighs> Kenny Byrne says, to be the best, you have to beat the best. Absolutely, Kenny, completely. Obviously, some of this is retrospective comments. Apologize for the delay if it's retrospective. Um, one member, one vote at a regional level would be a good starting point, Rich Turner says. Um, Baz Nichols says, my life for the association must be able to work in a more dynamic way. A problem arising in April cannot be tabled until October. Like we were saying, you said, Baz, it's, uh, it's uh, archaic. Uh, in my opinion, a board uh, like should be for the RPI. It should meet once a month. It doesn't have to be physical. We have what we're doing now. A board could meet six people, seven people could meet uh, remotely, but it needs to be able to be done quickly. Um, 
Um, John McCord says, five or six of the right forward-thinking people will take it forward. 20-odd people will never agree, and that's what stops progress. Blasnickel agrees. Um, I agree. And, and what I was... Um, I, I, my personal, again, only personal opinion is that, that six, five or six people would be a good number. But what I was, I also found out quite a few months ago now is that to be on the board or the council, as it is now, you cannot be on the council if you've got any business or financial interests in the sport of pigeon racing. Which to me makes no sense at all. Obviously, if there's a particular issue that comes up that's a direct conflict of interest, no, you can't be involved in that process. But to me, people that do have businesses or financial interests are the very people, or certainly a portion of them, that you want at that board level. Because perhaps they think slightly differently and are forward-focused and growth-focused and what have you. And to me, it's ridiculous that at the moment, a council member cannot have any business interests. For instance... I found out about this. I hope he doesn't mind me saying. I, I, well, he, he just told me. Um, I said to Chris Sutton, East Midlands region. I know Chris. And I said, do you ever fancy going to the top? He said, I couldn't go to the top because I have a pigeon photography business. I wouldn't be allowed to be a council member. Which blows my mind. You know? That's so counterintuitive to what the kind of people you need at the top. In my opinion, anyway. I'm not asking you to comment. I'm just making a statement here. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, no, I'm quite happy to comment on that. I mean, I can see, I can see the positives in having people like Chris and, and other people who are successful in in the in the business in business on the board. I've I've got no objection to that personally whatsoever. I mean, that's all that's needed is um, a kind of code of conduct over a conflict of interest. When a conflict of interest, you, you've got a you've got a document there which clearly describes what should and shouldn't happen. I, I, let me just say that Chris had no. It was a thing that came up in conversation that I didn't know that Chris wasn't saying he ever wanted to. It was just something I didn't know about. Um, yeah, John uh, Angwin says it's a 150 mile round trip to go to my regional meeting. Um, Baz Nichols says it's now in the public forum how MPs vote. Uh, this is not past the threat of naming and shaming a great stick, so why not publish which clubs voted these progressive notions down? That was Bez, Baz's comment. Um, Jason says, Mark Whiteford, I understand members declining since when, as anyone he said, racing is stopping. I don't think anybody's saying racing is stopping, but I think the dynamics of numbers shrinking will mean racing changes in a very different way over the next 10 years, Jason. Again, my opinion. We'll talk. I've, I've got a couple of questions to Ian regarding the future. Um, less fanciers means more cost to existing fanciers, David Woodhead says. Um... Rich Turner says, I'm on Derbyshire and South Yorkshire region. I'm losing the will to keep on the regional committee as to change anything is nearly impossible to change due to the way the rules are structured. Um, yeah, so we've got, we've got that. I will come back to more. Uh, we've got loads more. But if it's okay with you, Ian, we, we're going to slightly overrun the hour, if that's okay. But if you're okay yeah. with it, we, we, I will yeah. get everybody's question or, or comment um, mentioned. But I want to just come back to a few things, and then that will that will prompt any more questions, and then we can go through all of the other questions, and then, then that can be all the questions done. Um, yeah. You've been in the job three years now. Yeah. Um, I couldn't do your job if you paid me a lot more than you're being paid it would drive me potty you're a forward thinking progressive guy who has done their very best to push things forward there's some initiatives that we'll briefly mention shortly with that Richard's been involved in which you've helped get through 
But at the end of the day, you're a CEO that can't act like a CEO should be able to. Um, my worry is that one day you'll just have enough. I've said this on, 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 on video before, uh, that you'll reach a point where I don't want to see you reach a point where you think, well, what's the point? I, I think you are very good for what the RPRA needs. I think if the one member, one vote comes through, can get through, I think your job might become a lot easier. Um, but in the three years you've been in it, now knowing how everything works, as I said, the numbers speak for themselves, you know? We're not in the 50s and 60s anymore. The world has changed. The poll results, 91% people think change is needed. Yes, we've got to engage in this structure and the way things are done at the moment. But based on the last three years of you doing the job, what is your take on the future? <laughs> That's a very good question. I, I think unless, unless we do change things, there isn't going to be a future for very long. That, that sounds very pessimistic and very gloomy, but I'd like to think we have started to put things in, in progress to try and change in terms of trying to encourage participation, which isn't, you know, at the moment, it isn't generating thousands of people coming into the sport, but we must, people must appreciate where we've started from. We've started from ground zero and we're slowly through Richard's enthusiasm and, and, you know, his ability to engage with people, starting to grow numbers amongst young children slowly, but surely we are growing those numbers. And Richard starting to turn his attention to um, to adults, but I think I come back to it. I think the, the, the problem's not just about bringing new members in; it's about membership retention as well. So we have issues over again people not being able to race pigeons, not getting into clubs. We should be doing everything to try and retain those members. Um, we have we have issues with losses and, and health and things like that, um, and that's something we as an association should be should be looking to help with, and we are. We are looking at um, a project with with um, a few vets and DEFRA in terms of, you know, really analysing what's going on with these pigeons, where people have um, a problem where, you know, 40% of their pigeons are just dropping dead off a perch. And, we, and the RPRA has put some funding through that. And we're hoping to announce that now in March. Um, we're just putting the meat on the bones in terms of how that will work. Um, but, you know... The, the future is bleak unless we start changing things. And but things need to, at the moment, we've taken, I think over the three years, people say to me, look, Ian, you have achieved things, but the, the achievements are very small on the baby steps where we should be taking massive strides towards change if we do ensure the future for this sport. But I don't Hence, that well, but I know you well enough and type person you are to know that that's not good enough. Little steps is not good enough. It'd be the same for me. Yeah. You're seeing a ticking clock you're seeing a membership that's getting older. And the harsh reality is, I've said this before, it's not going to be easy to bring new people in in the numbers that are needed. No. Radically, something has got to change. Now, you mentioned Richard and the initiatives he's got. There's a new initiative that I saw in the homing world this week. Just briefly talk about that, if you would, and tell people about that. Yeah, and I'm... To be honest with you, it's pro it'd probably be a good idea to get Richard on you at some point. But but bearing in mind it's me at the moment, I'll I'll talk you through. I mean, Richard came on board some 18 months back. Uh, I don't know if pe people might not know Richard's background, but he was a school teacher. He ran a pigeon loft project on school through a lot of opposition through governors and teachers to start with, but he, he persevered and ran the, the the project from the school. And the children actively looked after the pigeons and, and raced those pigeons successfully. Um, and then they built that kind of project into the school curriculum, maths, geography, history, and science, and was actually highlighted in an Ofsted report as a as good practice to engage children with special educational needs. Um, so I was keen to try and run a project to try and encourage more people into the into the sport, and that's one of the things I mentioned in the RPRE interview. And it took some time to get off get off the ground, um, but uh, we were very very lucky to get Richard. Um, I'm not, I'm not just saying that. He's, he's just the right man for the job. Uh, he's grown the kind of junior membership. And at the moment, he's, he's concentrated on getting more and more schools involved. And I think, I think at the moment, we're supporting six 
six school off, six or seven school offs around the UK, which is which is going to grow because we're getting more and more inquiries all the time, which is a great way to introduce children and their parents to the sport. Um, and it's got us some great publicity all over the country. We've even been on BBC regional TV with it. Um, but of course, the next step after Richard's got that up and running, which will hopefully look after itself now, was to try and encourage participation in, in the older generation. So he wanted, he looked at some of the kind of organisations like um, UK hockey, rugby, football, in terms of what initiatives they have. And one thing that stands out was trying to bring people back to these kind of sports and hobbies who have perhaps left it for whatever reason. So the initiative he launched in the British Home World last week is basically trying to work with clubs. And this is going to be dependent on clubs engaging with this process, which isn't going to be for every club. If we can get, you know, if we can get 30, 40 clubs to start with on board, it'd be brilliant in terms of opening the doors and encouraging not just past pigeon fancies, but members of the public in to see what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, I've said previously on these shows and other videos that uh, kids, school kids are a great thing needs to happen. But the reality is, again, it's a slow process, you know? Yeah. The community laughs, school laughs are great. But actually then when you take, you know, I remember when I was 14, I was 12 when I started, first started. Um, Mum and Dad, I want a pigeon loft. We were lucky that the garden could do it. After about two months of persuading them, I was dead serious. They, I managed to get a cheap one. The money to do it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of barriers there for young people to be able to start. And and I think the community loft idea is the great one because it, it, it if it's the school lofts are even better because then they haven't got that pressure and, and, and hurdles. But there's something about engaging with, as you said, ex flyers and and new people. Um late thirties, forties, fifties are the time where people have perhaps got more time, things are not so chaotic. It, some people would find money a little bit easier, you know, the setup money and what have you. Um, and I think re-engaging people that have left and bringing new people in through clubs is a great idea. And that's what's needed to happen. Um, my yeah. personal opinion is that, you know, to see the sport thriving, I'm not entirely sure how much, how many of the numbers can be that can actually achieve. And you need the new blood in. And the thing, and and I think a community. I, I've spoke about community lofts idea as well. So where you can you take the, the the school lofts idea and you put that into like an adult context, into where there's yeah. four, five, or six people that have an interest in a loft on a community basis. That's something else. But you know, this is this is these are the kinds of things we're talking about. I'd like to get Richard on, uh, but definitely the way that yeah. he's making and and. Again, he's doing a good thing to get those people in, but we just got to keep doing it. So you don't, in reality... Yeah, and, and, it, and interestingly, enough, interestingly enough, Mark, on your communal loft idea, I mean, there was a, there's a communal loft um, in London that's been um, that's come about in the last six or eight months, and there's actually a proposition in, because I don't believe it or not, the rules don't allow for such things for communal lofts. The loft has to be registered in, in, in the name of an individual or partnerships. So there's a proposition in to amend Rule 16, which will allow communal lofts to be members in their own right of the RPRA. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a great way of engaging people. Hmm. I mean, I, I personally think that's like it. Look, if I look at if I look at me, for instance, I've got the time to race. I love pigeons. I've got the time to race. If, if there was a community loft nearby where I could pitch in and do my bit and other people were, I'd, I'd love to do that. I can't think of anything better than going on, not every Saturday, having to take the pigeons to the club on a Friday and be there every Saturday. But if I could go down on a Saturday when I can and, and see the pigeons come in, I can't think of anything better to do than that. Um, you know, and, and I just think we've got to think outside the box. The community loft idea takes away the pressure, the responsibility. It's not necessarily like people shirking the responsibility. It's down to time and money. And if you've got like community lofts, of say you know four to six people minimum then it, it, it takes a lot of that away my extension of that is that actually 
you now have community loss where people can own their own pigeons and they're competing against each other internally within the loft. There's all kinds yeah. of you could have community yeah. lofts which actually become clubs that actually yeah. race with the feds. There's all kinds of things. This is the kind of, in my humble opinion, things that needs to, to, to be brought in. Yeah. Because you've got to address that key thing. And the key thing is time and money. People have got a lot less of it in general. Yeah. Majority of people have got a lot less, definitely got a lot less time. And a lot of people have got less money, disposable money, that they used to have 30, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. I, I, think, I think time is probably the biggest barrier as opposed to money itself. I mean, there's, there's always people who are going to struggle financially to get involved, but I think time is probably the, the biggest barrier. But yeah. if you look at the setup cost of an individual 40-something setting up in pigeon racing, <laughs> let's say they're going to go with ETS, right? They got the loft, they got the pigeons. Yeah, they can be gifted pigeons, hopefully. They've got the clock system, the loft, the this, the that. It's still a chunk of money to do it halfway right to be able to compete with the guy that wins every week at the race. Now, if you can get that to say, right, we've got this, and to join the community loft, it's 100, 200 quid, and it's you know, 10, 20 quid a month or whatever it is to support the loft, it's a lot more accessible to more people. You see, to me, it's the how can you get thousands of people coming in? And this is where the public are. How can you get the public interested in pigeon racing? I mean, what you're talking about is, is, is to a certain degree, replicating what they've done in horse racing 20, 30 years ago. With syndicates of, of of owning a horse, it's the same kind of same kind of principle, isn't it? Exactly. I think that's the key because that mainstream public out there that still thinks pigeon racing is flat cap whip it somewhere in Yorkshire, they need to realise we're not there anymore. It is actually a serious thing. You know, it's not where it was. Some people don't like the fact that it's not where it was 34 years ago, but that's where we're at. You know, it, it blew my mind in China. Yeah. I'm a I'm a broad minded guy. I can think big and all that. It still blew my mind going to China in November. What fuels the Chinese sport and the growth of the sport? The harsh reality is gambling fuels it. Mm. Mm. Um you know, and, and one of the other things, if you look at the growth numbers of, of some of the Eastern European countries, Romania, I was in Romania, my partner's Romanian, and we did some loft visits there. Poland and Romania are growing in numbers. Why are they yeah. growing in numbers when we're declining? There's these kinds of questions, which I'm not going to get. We've hit the hour and we've still got more questions to go through. But these are the things we need to be looking at. Yeah. Um, one of the other things real quickly is it needs to be recognized as a sport, which would be a massive help if it was actually officially recognized as a sport. What's the situation with that, realistically, Ian? Well, I mean, that's something the RPR has been trying to achieve for a number of years. But recently, with the formation of the all-party parliamentary group, so we've now got a voice in parliament with a number of cross-party MPs supporting pigeon racing from conservative... Um, and Labour MPs and members from other parties. Um, we've recently had the AGM of the old party parliamentary group. I was up in Westminster last week and pointed a new chair. It was very supportive of our, of our aims and objectives. And some of the aims and objectives I don't really want to go into on the, on this programme. But one of the things we did discuss is, is recognition of, as a sport, you know. And everybody in the group doesn't see why it's not recognised. Well, can't understand why it isn't recognised as a sport. So... The group had actually write into the sports minister to try and gain um, support and, and and rectify that fact. It needs to be recognised as a sport. We've got to figure a way because it make it opens up the doors to to becoming want funding and to just become more real as a sport, yeah. which it should be. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. One last question I've got to you, and then we'll go through the questions here, and we'll 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 wrap up, but. You've talked about the future, but I want two scenarios. And I know what you're going to say to scenario two, but scenario one, as things are at the moment, do you agree that in 10 years' time, the support will be still there, but down to where the numbers just don't make things make sense? 
Um, in that you've got, for instance, you've got clubs, you've got federations now liberating from many play. You've got many liberations, federations liberating from the same liberation point. We, you're at a point now where people's organisations need to start merging. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I'll just take a step back. Where we'd be in 10 years, if we continue on the current decline, pigeon racing in this country will be unrecognisable, not, not, not for the better. Um, so, you know, addressing those changes and making the, the relevant rule change to assist those changes is essential. But with regards to the federations, I mean, I did put a report together to the RPRA Council, again, about 18 months back, suggesting that perhaps the RPRA, and this comes down to the rules again and, and how people's hands are tied, but perhaps we sh we've reached the stage now, like you said, where, and I'll use Wales for an example, you have three or four different federations in the same liberation site on a Saturday, all liberating separately, and the pigeons are coming in the same direction. Now, from a, a race management point of view, as a race controller, we have an impossible job. That needs to stop. That should be one liberation, and we should replicate that all over the country. When it comes to channel racing, I believe we should be set, and the RPRA, the governing body, should be set in the race programmes with a view to having national, you know, large liberations on the continent. Rather than little federations liberating two or 300 pigeons at a time, we should be liberating tens of thousands of pigeons at a time. And I'm sure that will help improve the racing in the long run. But, you know, the, these changes, they can, they can only happen if we start this catalyst to change in the rules. And, you know, in order to do that, this is people's opportunity, I think, really, to, to try, and, try and change things for the better. That's why it's so important. Right, let's get these questions and observations and then we'll... Uh... Uh, John Crean says, how much profit does the RPRA make a year? Pigeon racing is a multi-million pound business. The RPRA should be able to have a slice of the pie from the commercialism. Earn money and use the money for advertising, etc. This maybe can save the sport for a bit longer uh, than it's at the rate we're going now. People are never going to join a sport they don't know exists. Um, Jason Smith... You've said this is BS. I, I'm, I'm way behind, Jason, so I don't know if that was me saying something. Probably was saying something if you're saying this is BS or not. I don't know. Um, who else have we got? Uh, Can I just come back to John Crean's point, Mark? Yeah. I, I think I think he makes a valid point, you know. I mean, the RP, this year the RPRA didn't make a profit, but the, for the previous three years... That I've been involved. It, it has made it has made profits, but with the with the input, the massive input from the British Omen world. Um, now, what I, what I'd like to see, rather than and, and and steps have been made to do this, rather than just keep adding profits or surpluses, whatever you want to call them, to the to the kind of reserves of the association, is to start reinvesting that into into projects to to encourage more people into the sport, but also to support those already in the sport. And that's that's something hopefully we can. We can start doing in the future, but his point about the kind of money that's involved in sport, I mean, I think that's a really good point. There's, I mean, we all go to Blackpool, we all see the online sales, how much pigeons are making and how much money is being generated at these sales. And if a small percentage of that could come back into the sport um, to support the sport in whatever way that is, I think, I think that's, you know, I think that's essential, really. I would totally agree. And it's the kind of thing as my business side of things develop, I would be up for. But I wouldn't be up for it if all it's going to do is go into RPRA reserves. No, it, it, it'd have to be ring-fenced, wouldn't it, for a certain criteria and just be spent on certain things. Yeah, it would, yeah. But it, it, it's a good point. Um, da, 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 da. John McCord says, why is all the money given away for to charity from Blackpool, should a lot of it not go back into the sport? It's relevant to... Things Things have started to change there because they have contributed um, to the court case against the, the Peregrine Nest Insights, and they've also contributed to Richard's, Richard's project um, and funded some school lots. But, I mean, I, I think people need to recognise, and to be quite honest with you, it's, it's something I didn't recognise before I took up the post of the RPRA because... I was perhaps of a similar mind to John, you know. Why isn't our money being reinvested back into the sport? But I think we have to appreciate of, of where the Blackpool show started and who started it. It was a, a group of volunteers who still run the show today. People think the RPRA run the show. We support the show and staff at the Reading support the show. 
and we get a lot from that in terms of good publicity. But essentially, the show is run by a committee of people, a committee of volunteers who, whose core aim of setting the show up 48 years ago was to raise money for charitable purposes. Okay. Uh, Sean Haig says, is there, has there been a new race point approved at Bedhampton? Not yet. No, it's something we're looking into, though. Okay. Um, right, let's catch up with some more. And <laughs> we've got lots. Um, um, okay. How long have you got, Ian? How, what's the deadline here? Because I have got a list of questions, mate. We say 15 minutes. Okay. Right, let's yeah. fly through some of these. Uh, Kevin Frell, what's the RPRA doing about Falcon Sparrowhawk attack and also bringing new people? We'll talk about new people, Kevin. So with all due respect, we'll just talk about the Falcon. Well, the birds of prey. We briefly mentioned yeah, that before. But... I mean, a, a huge a huge issue and something where I live in the South Wales Valleys has been a massive issue. There's a pair of peregrine falcons about half a mile away from my loft in a quarry. And there's been a pair, obviously not the same pair, but there's been an a pair there since 1982. There's nothing new for us guys. And, you know, it's it's a difficult situation. People think the RPRA should sort this out. The question is, how do you sort it out? Um, I mean, again, without trying to keep my powder dry, there are things that are going on from a political point of view. But to be specific, what we, what we did, we've, um, I think, the biggest concerns we have at the moment is the artificial nesting sites in the towns and cities. And we were able to manage to get some rings from one of these sites in Aylesbury um, a number of years back now. But we've been using them to, obviously, we've, we've identified some local fanciers who are really affected by this pair of peregrines. And we started a court case um, to take the, uh, the owners and the local authority to court. Um, over this nest in sight, we we managed to get um, some advice of a, of a barrister and different people in terms of how to go about that. The claim was all ready to go, um, but unfortunately, we we had to take the action on behalf of an individual, not on behalf of the association, for for legal reasons. Um, so even though the RPRA were funding it um, and supporting it, the the action was being taken in theory by this individual. Uh, but unfortunately, just before the the court uh, papers were to be submitted, the um, the gentleman sadly passed away. Um, so we've had to restart the whole process and we are now probably 75% towards getting those those papers submitted. Now, the idea is if we can get a decision in our favour, then that obviously opens up the, the avenue to challenge all of them legally. And, and we have been discussing with some high-ranking people about, you know, in future, these boxes should be at least be licensed and part of the licensing process should be a consultation exercise, which includes the local pigeon racing community. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Anthony Bracker says, "What's Ian's what in what in Ian's opinion does he think needs to change to modernise the sport <laughs> and attract yeah, the younger it. generation?" That's probably a whole other show. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it, it probably is, but I, but I think we've started steps to, to address that. Richard, Richard's project is, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if you've spoken to Richard, Mark, but he's definitely the right person for the job. And um, he's taken steps to try and address encouraging people in there. But I think in terms of how as a sport we need to change, I think, I think you're right. That's probably a whole new different show and something you need to get Richard on and uh, concentrate on. Um. Tom Powell says, how will the one member, one vote idea be implemented? Will the option for post or electronic vote become acceptable? We talked about that earlier. I assume it would be both, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. The the, the proposal says that it'll, it'll utilise online and paper-based voting systems. It'd have to be a mixture of both. Um, you know, some people don't have access to IT, so we'd, we'd have to... We'd have to... In the, We'd have to put in place process where everybody can engage in it and, and have their say. So, yeah, it'll be paper-based as well as online. There are so many questions. There's no way I can get through them all, mate, in the time we've got. Um, it's 
it's yeah i'm seeing tens and tens of comments and questions and there's no way i can get through them so i apologize to everybody somebody did say uh, paul littlewood said need ian on again as there are too many things to discuss <laughs> Uh, and I probably would agree with that if you're up for it at another time, because yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, definitely. What I would, what I will do is I will go through all of the comments and the questions that people have asked, and I will save them. So you guys will be at the top of the list next time Ian comes on. We will, I will make sure that you're at the very top of the list of the questions that you've asked. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, Need to be recognised as a sport. Too many merchants milking the sport dry and putting nothing back in. Comments, comment, there's lots. And I apologise to everybody that's made them. I know I said I would read them all out, but it's quarter past nine and I cannot go through all of these. We would be here another hour. Um, so, yeah, and Kevin Farrell says it'd probably be about a week's long video. Uh, <laughs> um I would say, in closing, um, you've got a, an important time coming up, people watching this. Like we've said before, Ian said, you need to get your club involved, get your region involved, and get this vote through. Uh, the one member, one vote, Rule 139, is critical to the progress, in my humble opinion, I think Ian agrees, of this sport moving forward. And it isn't a case of, oh, we've got 10 years. It's a case of things need to start being implemented this year. No messing around. Within five years, massive changes have got to happen for this to, to turn around because it's a dismal, bleak picture, as pigeon racing currently is. A lot of people know my opinions on one-off racing, stuff we haven't got talk, time to talk about tonight. But... Change has got to happen, and that change involves this one member, one vote being a big part of it. Um, I will say that, you know, my goal is to promote the sport worldwide. My goal is to bring as many people in as possible to be interested about it. That's not necessarily to start keeping pigeons, but at least have an interest because that sparks people to be able to want to keep them out. We talked about my three-phase plan last week. My offer still stands to the RPRA and any organization anywhere in the world that if they want it, I will help in any way I can without getting involved in the, the governing structure. I'll help in the uh, for free uh, in any way, shape or form with the skills that I've got. Um, and I would personally want to say thank you, Ian, one for coming on and sharing and, and, and talking to everybody, but also for being here three years because it's a job I couldn't do, and I and I appreciate and, and I speak for a lot of people on here. You've got a lot of fans on here of you and what you're trying to do, and it, it's great. And uh, I I really hope that one member one vote can get through because I think that will then free you up to be able to really then do what you've been wanting to do for probably since you started. Yeah. Yeah. No, and thank, thank you, Mark. Thanks, thanks for giving me the time to come on, and um, thanks for everybody who took the time to to listen. I know it's been a long time, but um, and I, well, some hour and twenty minutes, but yeah, it's been really enjoyable. Thank you. No, thank you, and, and and let's definitely do it again. I would definitely like to get Richard on and talk about some of the stuff he's doing. I would like to come back on you to come back on and talk. And like I said, my promise to everybody that's made comments, um, I think Ian Ian Gill sums up. This is one of the last comments that's just come in. Fair play to Ian for sticking his head above the bar parapet. And I think that's that's what I, I feel as well. You, you're prepared to engage, come in, answer questions, and talk to people. And that's, that's a big thing. So I will save all the questions that weren't answered. I will go through them and save them, and we will, we will have them next time Ian comes on. Uh, and thank you very much, Ian. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Cheers. All the best. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye -bye. Um, I would say um, I would say folks that please go and get involved let's get this one member one vote through um, it 
needs to happen. And I'll say, and, and, and I haven't spoke to Ian about this or anything, but with how hard Ian's job is, if one member, one vote doesn't come through, I don't know exactly what more he can do. And I don't personally, and again, I'm only speaking on my personal opinion, I don't want to see... Um, I don't want to see Ian going anywhere. And my fear is that if one member, one vote doesn't come in, what else can he do that he's not that he's been trying to do for the last three years? Something radical needs to happen. One member, one vote's the catalyst to make sure that happens. We could have had a three-hour show tonight. I apologise to people, as I say, that didn't get their questions or observations. I will keep all of them. We can continue the conversation on the thread of these uh, of this show, and we will continue um, to talk about some of these issues next week on the show next Monday. Thank you, everybody, for watching. All being well, you will see a new background. You will see a new place uh, that I will be doing the show from next week. Hopefully, all being well, I will have moved successfully. Again, thank you for watching, everybody. I will keep all of these and uh, I'll keep all the comments and thank you to everybody that's watching. We've still got over 100 people watching, which is uh, really good. Thanks again, everybody, and catch you next week.